Welcome to the Nerds and Friends podcast. Today we have the full roundtable of nerds. We have co-hosts Will Shaw, Carrie Duvall, Caleb Whittle, and joining us today is Adam G. Fleming, author and extraordinary man and an honorary nerd as we've established already. And uh, we're very happy to have you on the call today. Thanks, everybody. It's good to be here. Really good to be here. Yes, Great to sir. have you. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, well, friends. Cool. Let's dive right in. Tell us about your books that you got out and uh, why our viewers should check them out. Let's hear about it. All right. Well, uh, if you if you like lighthearted, I can see a lot of smiles in this room already. Obviously, people like to joke around, have fun. I like to have fun in my books, and I like lighthearted satire stuff. So, um, you know, the steampunk genre can be a little bit of uh, a little bit dark, but I my, I would say this is steam. Uh, lighthearted steampunk so the That's first awesome. book i did is called satchel pong and the great migration the first Ooh. book in the series i should say um i was writing this other series that's more set in the real world with a rock band um and i wanted them to be able to discuss and like debate like real nerds to discuss mm-hmm. and debate like what these books mean and stuff so i started writing satchel pong and the great migration in 2016 as backstory for this other series that still hasn't come out yet That's you wrote cool. a book within a book it's, a, it's <laughs> i create worlds within worlds is what i like to say well it turned into you know eight inches of books um, awesome. so, mm-hmm. <laughs> so two that'll years, fill you up uh, eight inches yeah, of book will fill you right up <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh my god sorry i'm on fire today that's all right that's all right so so um this is the first one about two years after i wrote 85 percent of it i pulled it out again and started looking at it and i was like this is pretty good i I think i'm actually going to publish it even though it was just created as backstory for something else and then i ended up with okay satchel pong and the search for emil ennis that's the second one Thank you. My sister did all of these, by the way, and she's awesome. Her name is wow. Bethany Keener. Satchel, uh, this one is called Antoinette Joe and the Sky Dwellers. Wow, I love that. And then uh, it, we get a little twist. It gets a little bit, um, oh, you know, when the world is ending, you've got to have some profits, right? So the world <laughs> is ending. So it's St. Kipstifer and the Miraculous Yarkarma. And then the fifth one and final one, which just came out about three months ago, three or four months ago, is called The Prophets of Doom and The Leaping Hedgehog. So, wow. That is great titles. I love those. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. So, so uh, the the essential story there is Satchel Pong is a meteorologist in his world. That's a, an elected official position. And he's been tracking the weather and realizing that things are getting hotter. So he, yeah, and he's supposed to give an annual report and he hasn't done it for a decade because he's afraid. And um, he starts getting challenged in the street, like, how's come you haven't given a report? We all know it's getting hotter. You should do something about it. So the, the first book kind of starts out with Satchel Pong trying to decide, do I need to lead my people on some kind of a great migration to find somewhere else in our world? You know, and as you do, it ends up kind of science fiction like is it possible to travel with some kind of a zeppelin to another planet Mm. so there's the you know by the time you get in books four and five there's the question of interstellar travel coming up and i don't want to spoil too much of the story but uh it was a lot a lot of fun to write so now i got to get back to the thing that i wrote it for initially and finish (laughs) that Oh, those sound brilliant. I can't wait. Uh, where can our viewers find those? Are they on Amazon and in other they are on They are on Amazon. So you'll want to look me up on, um, as Adam G. Fleming mm-hmm. and you should be able to find them. Uh, and I also love, I, I love making new friends. So I love it when people go to my website at adamgfleming.com and you can, you can get autographed copies. I, you know, I've talked to some other authors who like they kind of dread going to the post office. I'm like, I love it. Yeah, I, I'll sign my book, and yeah, I mean, maybe I only make a couple bucks, and it's hardly worth my time. But I love to send my books out in the mail. It's so fun. So yeah, that's awesome. 
Yeah. Thank you. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely put in the description of the podcast, your website. So everyone can go there. So if you're listening to this, mm-hmm. check out adamgfleming.com because I know I'm going to check them out because I want an autographed copy because those books look awesome. Absolutely. Right. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So no, I got, brilliant. shall I tell you about some more books? Cause these are only five of like 12 that I have out. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah. Let's hear yeah. about them. Hit us, hit so, us with it. Let's, let's so hit here's the whole what spectrum I got. here. Here's another one. I wrote this with a guy named Justin Fike. Um, I love to brag on Justin because he's such an amazing writer. Uh, Mm -hmm. He got a master's degree in creative writing from Oxford, which I don't necessarily think you have to get education, but if you're going to, why not Oxford, right? (laughs) Um, You're going for a prestige award as it is. uh, Right. Just getting there. I mean, he was waitlisted. Let's, let's be real, (laughs) (laughs) but he got in, so he, he did it. And uh, so, so Justin and I, we, we ended up at, a, at the same conference together in Thailand. We've known each other since he was a teenager. He's about 10 years younger than I am. But um, we've known each other a long time. We ended up at this conference in Thailand, and there were some people from Texas there. And we we're just having coffee early one morning, watching the sun come up over the bay. It's gorgeous. We're like, what's it like for a Texan the first time they come to Thailand? You know, <laughs> what's that, what's that got to be like? So we started riffing on the idea and we came up with this character called Stetson Jeff Stetson. You know, like Bond <laughs> James Bond. <laughs> like, like Bond James Bond. That's so he, awesome. He never puts the pause in there so people get all confused. Like, your name is what? Stetson Jeff Stetson. So he's, he's part of the hat company. Uh, he's, he's an heir to the hat company. So he's got plenty of money. And he basically travels the world in search of uh, justice and a good piece of steak. And I like to say this name... <laughs> <laughs> this main character is a cross between Chuck Norris and Forrest Gump. Mm. Uh, okay, you, I have to buy that as imagine, soon as this podcast is over. That's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> if you can imagine, for, yeah, somebody who's got Chuck Norris's kind of can-do, kick-ass attitude with a Forrest Gump perspective on life. Um, so I've been working really hard lately to get these done in audiobook. I've got a I've got a studio set up in the basement. I'm doing a chapter every day. Nice. I'm just like, I, sometimes it's all I can do to not laugh at the work we did. <laughs> I mean, it's like, uh, maybe I could read some. He's, he's always referring to this uh, book by a Texas Ranger. Again, it's world within world. So this, this guy named Jeremiah P. P. Johnstone, Texas Ranger, and, and he's always quoting it as if, you know, as if he, um, uh, so here that he that a camel accidentally got killed in Morocco, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and so what do you do with a dead camel? Well, you eat it, right? But the camel's name was Pooh. So, <laughs> so so he says, "This is good, champ. I tell your ma I like it." He told her, and I got a big smile out of the deal. Then I said, "What kind of meat is this? What am I eating here? You are eating poo." Oh. With all the traveling I'd done already, I should have learned not to ask what kind of meat I'm eating when I'm in a foreign land. It's bound to be not steak. <laughs> then, he quotes, then he quotes his hero, the Texas Ranger. There's only one question you should be asking when you're eating at someone else's table. Is it tasty? If the answer is yes, just use your mouth for chewing and leave it at that. So that's oh, awesome. he's that's always glorious. quoting his, his Why hero. words. <laughs> yes uh jeremiah p johnstone always has these like pithy kind of down homespun texas quotes that that we made up that are hilarious <laughs> that's awesome uh, and, and and they're they're a little bit so like the satire here is actually making fun of texans to be honest because there's a little mm-hmm. bit of that kind of let's say chivalrous but almost semi-chauvinistic kind of mentality mm-hmm. that runs through like whatever Stetson Jeff says, but it's super innocent. He, you know, he, he doesn't mm-hmm. mean anybody any harm and it's set in the eighties too. So it's kind of, oh, that's fun. It, yeah. it's playing with all the tropes like blood sport. And so the first book is beat down in Bangkok and he travels to Thailand. He gets in a kickboxing uh, tournament. You know, the second one is mayhem in Marrakesh. And then the third one that we have out, so we just have three out so far. The third one is Pandemonium, Pandemonium in Paradise, which is Amish country, Pennsylvania. Nice. <laughs> so, 
He's Absolutely. A, he's, he's got it. You got to have a chase scene between, you know, like a forklift and an Amish buggy. You know, it's like a low yeah. speed pace. Mm. Oh, oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. that's delightful. <laughs> oh, we have a lot of fun. Man, it's you fun. just like, and that's the, like, like, that's the most interesting to me because you just wouldn't mess with the Amish. Though. Like, like you've got, uh, you've got hands and forearms that have been working all day, every day. <laughs> like, I, I mean, yeah. You know, not to not to get into like theories about the Amish mafia, which I'm sure exists, but holy dang, man! <laughs> well, Adam, that, how do you how do you go from steam steampunk comedy to you know the guy from Texas who's traveling around the world? Like, I'm really curious how you're like going back and forth between that. Well, it, I mean, there, there's the there's a couple of common themes and threads. Whether I'm writing a fantasy story or or a, a one set in, in our world, which is you know, when I was 13, I went from the cornfields of Illinois to Central Congo, oh, wow. almost mm-hmm. almost overnight, and we lived there for a year. And um, my parents did mission work, you know, and uh, it's a dangerous place. And so, and 13 is like this impressionable age, you know, where um, like your whole life sort of revolves around your friends, you know, your social life is kind of blossoming. But when you get pulled out of that, you know, the only school you've ever known and dropped in a completely different culture, it's just like culture shock is, is huge. So it was a tough time in my life for sure uh, that year, but it also completely changed my worldview and my perspective. So what happens is, you know, Stetson Jeff, he goes to Thailand, you know, it's kind of like the what's going on when a Texan goes to Thailand, but I do the same thing in my steampunk books where Satchel Pong has to lead a migration and he's leaving his culture and his mm-hmm. island nation, that's kind of Hawaii-ish a little bit, and, mm-hmm. you know, going somewhere else and trying to figure out what's going on in the world, and so I think the common theme, whether it's fantasy or set in the real world, is like people who travel and, and are trying to, trying to adjust and figure out what's going on um, mm-hmm. in the world, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What made you settle on uh, steampunk as a genre? I've, I've always been interested by the aesthetic. I love the stories that come out of it. I've never read a steampunk book, only ever anything that's like a, like a graphic novel or a comic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I do love the aesthetic. In fact, if there's anything I'm following on Instagram that's just for the visuals, and obviously I don't dress steampunk but I I love the visuals. Like I I love that aesthetic too. And I don't know. I just, um, I wanted to set a book inside the other book and I wanted to pick, uh, pick something. I can't, I, I don't really know why I started writing steampunk for that. It just seemed like a thing to do. So I did it. I've got the I've got the weirdest analogy here, but I I've, I've read this web comic for a long time called questionable content. And there's this character named Jeb the Redneck who they first you meet him at a bar, but then it turns out he's like this really pol- prolific uh, steampunk romance novelist. Uh-huh. And it's it's just this amazing running joke that he's actually a super famous author under all these pseudonyms. And I like there's just something about this that's like striking the tone for me because I'm yeah like it's uh are, are, are all the, are the tones of all your books kind of like that tongue in cheek kind of like Terry Pratchett as comedy or like do you uh, what do you what all do you what what do you what do you like to write as far as like these these travel and uh, and um, discovery stories tone wise yeah I like to keep it lighthearted so I think I, the way I've been trying to describe it lately is I'm trying to write on this tightrope <laughs> between the absurd and the sublime mm-hmm. <laughs> so. I like that like like my my worldview is definitely like things are absurd it, it, either death is absurd and life is beautiful or maybe it's the other way around <laughs> it's all, life is I dig, you know, I dig. life is absurd and death is beautiful or you know and so i think it, it, it's like how do you capture that so some of my stuff has serious moments in it i mean mm-hmm. don't don't get me wrong there's the, there's the kind of like the philosophical edge coming in there too not in a heavy handed way, but just like some, my wife is kind of my key reader. Like Stephen King talks about having an audience of one, you know, Mm -hmm. like you should write with one person in mind. So I always say if she, if I hand her a piece of rough draft, it's just a chapter or half a chapter and she laughs sitting on the couch with me, you know, a couple hours after I wrote it, she laughs. 
or she goes, this made me cry. Or she says, this is even deeper than you realize. So it's either laugh, cry, or, or make you think in a new way. Mm -hmm. If I'm hitting any of those three for her, I know I can hit it for other people too. You know, That's so awesome. yeah. I don't know. Did I answer your question? Yeah, you did. Gary? That's well, yeah. And, and, and you expanded on it in an interesting way because you get to like, you, you get to see that feedback from your, uh, from your readers. Um, a good, a good chunk of us here either. Uh, I mean, everyone here is either a writer or an artist uh, as far as like the rest of the table mm -hmm. goes. And one of the things that I uh, personally love doing, and I, I, I think I heard it in like a, an interview with uh, Chuck Palahniuk where he's, where he, he said like, join a writer's group, like, like have, have people that you can bounce this stuff off of and, and like, and see like what the reactions are, how to make it clearer. And like, uh, I like, if I'm ever having like a lore idea, that's like just fucking off the wall for anything high fantasy I'm doing, uh, I call yeah. Will because Will is a mythology nerd. And it's really cool that you've got that, you've got that angle. Uh, you've got that angle at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, she's, she's doing some editing for me on a, on a uh, nonfiction book that I'm doing right now. And that's oh. one thing that she's getting more and more into lately is, is doing editing work for people. So that's nice. awesome. Um, what's a, what's your nonfiction book about? So I went uh, in November to Porto, Portugal, and I hiked the Camino de Santiago from Porto to Santiago de Compostela in Spain. It's about put in about 200 miles in two weeks. So I was oh. walking, walking about 14 miles a day with an 18 pound pack. And that nice. one is going to be called Old, Old Roads, New Friends. Um, I decided that the theme for my journey after I was halfway through, you know, you don't know what's going to happen when you do something like that, but you meet other people on this pilgrimage route, um, in the, in the hostels and stuff. And, uh, I know you might, you might think it's a young man's game, but it's totally not. There's people who are 80 years old doing that stuff. And that's um, awesome. It, it is pretty awesome. And so I met, met a couple of those dudes before and they are, uh, interesting yeah. like like the the guy the guys that are that are 80 they're like yep been hiking or a trail guide for you know the past 50 years and they're just like these yeah. these stringy like real hard bitten like modern prospector type dudes right right well i wish i was stringy <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i'm gonna yeah. have to hike it a few more times but anyway I, I i was sitting with five other people one night we're just having dinner and drinking wine together and stuff and i said hey i just want to make a toast and they all looked at me and I held up my wine glass and I said to old roads and new friends, because we're walking on Roman road, numeral XIX, no, number 19. Wow. Um, and, mm. you know, like sometimes you see these mileposts that are 2000 years old um, sitting just by the trail. It's it's sick. Um, and that was all I said just to old roads and new friends. And they were all like, that's it. That 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 sums it up because you, you're walking on this 2000 year old road, meeting people that no computer algorithm would ever match you with. And no. it's awesome. Like they're cool. They're, every mm -hmm. single one of them, like this, uh, this woman from Germany runs a fish restaurant, this guy from Ireland who used to work in finance, you know, he was a CFO. So you got like people from all walks of life, rich, poor, doesn't matter. And, um, when I got to Santiago, the, the woman who ran the fish restaurant uh, in, from Germany had gotten there a day before and she was waiting for me at the cathedral and she had tattooed it on her wrist. Old roads, new friends. Whoa, that's awesome. Nice. It was it was sick, man. I was like, because when you're a writer, right, and you come up with a super pithy, <clears throat> short, poetic kind of toast for people like that, yeah. and then they tattoo it on their wrist like, how much better could it get? So yeah, I have to. Add, I presume that you also have gotten a tattooed on you since then. I have not. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but I've, I've I've thought about it. You know, she actually said to me when we were hiking together one day that the Camino is like a tattoo, and I was like, "What?" <laughs> and she said, "Well, when you're halfway through your first one, you're either thinking I'll never do this again, or you're thinking when can I do it again." as soon as possible when can i i go for the next one and so obviously she was thinking not only about when she could do the camino again but what her next tattoo was going to be and <laughs> it turned out to be inspired by what i said so 
I, no, I don't have any tats. I guess I'm not. Maybe I just lost my nerds and friends. Uh, uh, no, you good. Honorary not. card. <laughs> nah. Uh, Tattoos are not I have part no of tats, the equation. So. Yeah, okay. Caleb doesn't have any. I've got just one. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, Will, do you have any tattoos? I do not. I have a, a horrendous fear of needles, actually. Ah, uh, uh, cool. that would do it. I don't like needles I, either. I have, I have the itch. I'm in the other direction. Like, <laughs> I've. I've got an Evil Dead tattoo because there's only so many one-handed guys in cinema that are that badass. Like, <laughs> I like I I I, I love them, but uh, you know, it's it's um it's also about finding the right artist too. Like, mm-hmm. I wouldn't I wouldn't roll into just any uh, place without checking out who's who who's doing ink there first. Yeah, what? yeah, you're gonna carry it the rest of your life. It's not like mm-hmm. an 18 pound pack you're gonna carry for two weeks exactly so yep you're not going to be able to put it down yeah mm-hmm. so I, I i haven't done it but uh yeah if i was going to do anything i think that might be it it's a good one it's a good one it is it's would be cool well yeah. adam tell us about your writing process uh, i'm sure we're all curious about what your kind of routine looks like or are you an outliner or like a plotter or a pantser or like what's kind of your what's kind of your work routine we're curious yeah, I, I'm not a plotter, um, which what, what I found out the drawback to that is I love to just like dig in and start. You might find some characters in my book that you're like, this is a cool character. And then they never re- occur again because I mm-hmm. forgot about them the next day. And then I just kept writing. Well, it's, well that was a rando. Sorry. <laughs> not my fault. <laughs> yeah. Well, look and, what kind I, of impression they made. Yeah, right. Well, some, sometimes they do, and sometimes they get brought back uh, three books later, too. Nice. But, you have a favorite side character. I like. I, this is a bit of a leading question, because I do have a mm. joke that I ran by Will, where I came up with a dumb <laughs> nickname, and really, like, and I had to come up with a backstory for him, Like, I, but I want to know, like, what yours is. A favorite rando or a favorite sidekick? Uh, rando or sidekick, your choice. Like, Um... I guess I'm kind of stoked about getting Stetson Jeff's sidekick going in the second trilogy because it's going to be a pot-bellied pig. Yes. um, Excellent. (laughs) Stetson Jeff is not happy about it at first because he was born in Texarkana, which means that he's technically not a Texan, according to his family. Mm. He doesn't (laughs) like that. Uh, He wants to be Texan. He was born like two miles out of the state. So they're constantly ragging on him about being a Razorback. And, <laughs> and so like the, all, the, all they do for Christmas is like give him, uh, you know, Arkansas Razorback placemats or, uh, you know, uh, beanbag or whatever. And uh, so finally they just give him a pig. <laughs> oh, man, That's this is suddenly fun. this is suddenly yeah. every which way. And I'm down with it. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. I can't wait to read this trilogy, man. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I hope you have fun with it. Yeah, no. So, so many authors we've had on have really like good, serious, like, you know, books that are really like intriguing because of their, you know, heavy subject matter. But we really haven't had anyone who writes stuff that just sounds hilarious and witty and engaging and like a fun page turner. So, this is really exciting. I can't wait to read your stuff, man. This is awesome. Mm-hmm. Thanks. I appreciate that. I don't know if I answered the question about sidekicks. I guess I did. Yeah, no, so. you, no, you did. It's, if it's, if it's a razor, if it's that razor back, that sounds freaking hilarious. <laughs> I what, mean, what, what, what's, what's the pig's name? I got to know. <laughs> uh, Unless it's I a think, spoiler. Which can, okay. I can wait. <laughs> so if you, if you buy the, the, so the, the three um, Stets and Jeff are available individually as eBooks, but if you buy the paperback, you get all three of them. Plus, a bonus short story called A Very Stetson Christmas. Nice. Which is in the back. You know, he travels to three different countries and then he comes home finally at the end of the year. And I have to, I, I don't remember. I think he names the Razorback in this very, very uh, Stetson Christmas, but I don't remember what the name is. <laughs> uh, I should, but so yeah, we wrote these a lot. Is it Steve Buscemi? No. That's not right. That would be incredible. <laughs> that would be a pretty good, <laughs> a pretty good name for a pig, though. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I might name my pit, my next pig uh, 
Steve Buscemi. Uh, honestly, to, <laughs> honestly, to, to, to jump off of that in writers group style, I'd probably yeah. call I'd probably call him Mr. Pink after Steve Buscemi's character in Reservoir Dogs. Oh, oh okay. Nice. Okay. Well done. Well, I'll have to see if he's named yet or not. I think he is, but I can't. I can't even remember because we wrote those quite a while ago. Mm -hmm. So, th one of my goals for this year is to get the next three Stetson Jeff books out. I have drafted uh, book four going to Belize and book five um, actually going on the Camino, which will nice. be interesting to edit now that I've actually been on the Camino. Oh, Ooh. that's cool! Yeah, man. Nice so, real world crossover there. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. How, awesome. how many it's kind of interesting uh because you have a, a book series that's somewhat grounded in reality and then uh -huh. you have like the other one where it's just these fantastical things like global warming or a political figure afraid of his con constituents in that uh yeah well that's just skimming the surface of how it starts too <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome uh sorry what's the question will I was just making a joke about that. <laughs> oh, <Yeah. laughs> Adam, how many? Caleb had a question. Yeah. How many books are you currently in the process of writing, drafting? Like, how many do you have going on at at once that are you know not published yet? So I have I have three step two steps and Jeff books that are drafted. Uh, Justin and Fike and I have a, an urban fantasy series that we've drafted too and we haven't touched for a long time. Then I have the Zeppelin Zeke thing, which is the rock band that talks about uh, Satchel Pong. And that one's either one or three. So let's call it three. Uh, and then I have Old Roads, which is almost done. Um, so eight or nine in process. And I haven't even started a new draft of anything recently because I'm like, I, I need to get this down to like four or five and make it more mm -hmm. manageable. So this year I'm hoping to get a bunch of these things that are, that have been uh, going on for a while and just get them done. That's so cool. Yeah. That's yeah. so cool. Having fun. It's too many right now. It's a little <laughs> bit, it's a little bit too many. And it just feels like it pulls my, my brain in too many directions. Just thinking someday I got to finish that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. that's good though you've already put a lot of work into them and you have projects to work on i know for me like when i finished my first two books i was like okay i've been having i've been working on these for a while now i got to figure out what to do next and it was daunting at first till i found my next couple of projects you know so i feel like it's a good problem to have too many yeah progress. it could be i think <laughs> people oftentimes ask me in these kind of interviews like what's your advice for starting authors and uh, on that topic, so let me just add on that topic, if you are have not published a book yet, just write one book. Mm -hmm. Like, put mm -hmm. if you've got a couple of ideas, put them on a Trello board, stick them on the shelf somewhere. Don't you won't forget. I mean, if it's really good, you won't forget mm -hmm. if it's really worth it. Um, but but just get that first one done, like you said, Josh, or the first one or two done, and then it's like okay, now I know how to do this. Somebody once said that the, the best way to learn how to write a novel is to write your first one. Mm -hmm. You just got to write the first one. And I think learning how to do it includes putting it on Amazon, even if you're going to think it sucks five years down the road or whatever, get it edited, do all the stuff and put it out there. And, yep. uh, and then now you know how to do it. And then you can, so I wouldn't recommend that for somebody who's on their first go round. That's smart. Yeah. No, and it, boy, when you publish that first book, it feels so good. When you get that paperback from Amazon, it's like, oh. <laughs> yeah, it's just such an incredible feeling. And then when you get number 10, it's like, eh, I got, I got three <laughs> more that I'm working on right now. So, but no, it's important to stop and celebrate. And I had a goal of getting 10 in my life and I passed that That's awesome. um, last year. And then I was like, okay, well, it's time to ratchet up to now my goal is 25, but I'll That's hit awesome. that in a couple of years. So nice. Got to keep setting your goals, set them attainable, and then set them a little higher when you're done. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's it like switching gears between those, uh, like those different genres and like those different worlds? Because um, you said like you're getting pulled in a lot of different directions. How do you refocus? Do you have to like go back and reread it or do you have like a mood board or like mm -hmm. how do you go from being sets in 
to being satchel? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think I think little trans transitional things like just taking a five minute walk can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Right now, I'm doing the audio recordings of the first three Stetson Stetson Jeff books, partly because um, I'm I'm moving in the direction of making this more like my living, and so audiobooks is like thirty percent of the market. So you're crazy oh. not to have them, you know. That's good to know. So, so I'm trying nice. to get I'm trying to get those done, but at the same time. We, I think we published this volume one in 2016 or something. So like I said, I can't even remember what the pig's name is because I haven't got there yet. <laughs> but um, I'm reading them. I'm doing the audiobooks partly just to refresh my memory about what happened in the first three so that I can go edit number four because I haven't touched that for a long time. So um, shifting gears... I don't know. I, I don't find it that difficult, but I don't know if I can tell you what the tip or trick is for that. Sounds like you're just a good writer. <laughs> yeah, it's just writing. I yep. mean, it's uh, um, and the drafting process, since I told you, like, I'm a pantser, so I just write by the seat of my pants. So all I need is a good block of an hour and say, OK, go, you know, and I can just draft and it doesn't matter what the topic is. Um, and, awesome. and I think my sense of humor runs through whatever the genre is. So it's not like I'm trying to change who I am in between. Does that, that make sense? sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, fascinatingly enough, I don't think we have met a planner on the podcast yet, which like really cracks me up because of the way that um, people are taught writing mm -hmm. where where you're taught to like, point structure have your architecture and your framework but there are so many like very good organic writers that like have kind of an end point and they want the characters to tell them the story that i'm yeah. i'm i'm fascinated that like especially in terms of comedy because I, I i i think like I, I can't remember who said it about comedy but uh but uh like explaining comedy is like dissecting a frog like at the end nobody's happy and the frog dies <laughs> like it, it's yeah. it's it, uh, yeah. like like being able to to be in the moment and make something that like you know i can assume probably cracks you up or cracks your wife up sounds like a a, a real a real benefit to me so believe it or not my uh my wife when she was 10 years old sent a cassette tape with questions on it to madeline lengel and mm. Madeline Lengel recorded responses and sent them back to her. Wow. We had, we had a studio engineer turn that cassette into a, a MP3 a year or two ago. And I've listened to it a couple of times, just listening to, to Madeline Lengel respond to my wife's 10 year old self. Uh, was that 35 years ago or so? Um, it, it's pretty incredible, but she, she talks about how, you know, my wife asked her the question, like, where do you get your ideas? And she said, the ideas come while you're writing. And, and I was like, that is so true. That happens for me all the time that uh, it's these serendipitous moments that are unexplainable how they happen. But like in the Satchel Pong uh, um, series, maybe in the first or second book, I started using a swear word that was river sludge. Like in this one culture, it's like the dirtiest thing you can say to somebody is you river sludge and blah, blah, blah. Because um, I, I, I don't know. I think we can be more creative than using the F-bomb all the time, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, in, at the end of book four, it, it, there's like this, the whole culture of like why river sludge is so bad just slammed into place in, in a way that ended book four and it was like i'd been using the term river sludge for like two or three books already and it was like i don't know you'll just have to read it but it was like one of those moments where i was like oh, that's what it's all for that's mm -hmm. <laughs> that's it's now going to serve this purpose of uh um, a major um uh, political shift I'll, I'll just leave it at that. So, so you get to be like, oh my God, I'm a genius. Yeah, that's, that's the, oh my God, I'm a genius moment.
but it happens like Madeline Langell said while you are writing mm-hmm. it's like a ship has to be in motion to turn you know it's the same kind uh, of well said kind of idea mm-hmm. so that's fantastic yeah. she knew well, what she was talking about she has a few uh bestsellers yeah yeah that's just a, just a few <laughs> Yeah. Well, I can't wait to read about Satchel Pong and Stetson Jeff Stetson. These are awesome characters. I'm so stoked. Hell yeah. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Yeah. Does anyone else have any other questions for Adam? We really appreciate your time coming on. Mm-hmm. I love doing this stuff. Oh, it's so fun. We can't wait to read your books and have you on another time. This was a super fun conversation. Thank you so much for your time. It was great talking to you. You're welcome. And I would love to come back on after you've read some of my books, because that, that could be a whole, a great, uh, you know, second, second uh, conversation for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's going to oh, yeah. happen for sure. Sweet. Well, thank you so much, Adam. Really appreciate it. And uh, I'll send you an email once the podcast is live. I'm going to put it up later today. And I'll make sure we have your website in the uh, video description. All of our viewers, again, check out Adam G. Fleming on Amazon. Check out AdamGFleming.com. Check out his awesome books. And thank you again for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Josh, Will, Caleb, and Carrie. I appreciate it so much. Have a great day. Have a good one. Have a great day. I almost 